All right, so everything is being recorded for all posterity. How are you tonight, Alan? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. Your name sounds French. You French? I am. My father is off the boat. Yeah, my mom came over from Canada, so she was from Quebecois. Larry, I'm changing your name. Sorry, sir. Ever get back over there, uh, Alan? Uh, yeah, it's been a while since I went with my dad. He passed away a few years ago. So. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, was it the south of France or what part of France? Uh, northern France. Mm -hmm. Brittany? North of Paris. Oh, okay. Now, is that quite is that considered Brittany or is that something else? Rhone Valley? Uh, I'm not sure of the exact name of the region. Um, it was very close to the Belgian border. Oh, nice. Probably good. Sprechersee uh, Deutsch? Jawohl. <laughs> Host Flotilla 39. 39.6. Well, I thought Bob uh, Hennessy, who's, a, who's at a 39.6? I am. You are, Anita? I am. Um, Drew well, Sox. Yeah. Okay. Well, Drew, who's host flotilla 39.06, I wonder? The host for the sessions I've been doing recently has been the flotilla commander. That's John Robertson. Oh, is that you, John? Are you logged in now? Thirty-nine oh six. Yeah, well, we got a thirty-five oh six too. A lot of a lot of sixes. Hello, Bob. Mike McGann reporting. How are you tonight, sir? I was in your beautiful city today. Yeah, no kidding. Where'd you go? A uh, couple of Irish pubs. Yeah, so no it's a good thing. What's that? I said, no kidding. Which ones? Shenanigans, uh, somewhere in Division Street. Well, there's a lot of them in the city. I can't really remember at this late hour, so you'll have to forgive me. There you go. Well, that doesn't sound good. Oh, <laughs> River, River of Shannon. Have you heard of River of Shannon? I think that's over there by the NBC Tower, maybe. Okay, I didn't know that was going to be a quiz. I didn't study for this. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. You probably know him better. I quit drinking a long time ago. Well, the other one was called um, uh, Bridge, no, Stone, Stone Bridge. Yeah, and no it's because we were going, my son lives up there by Wrigley, and the uh, place uh, that is an Irish pub in the neighborhood right on Clark Street, we went there thinking it would be open today, but it was closed. Yeah, no kidding, son of a gun. So we had to go to this place, which was a, a soccer, uh, some kind of soccer hangout, and they were all cheering for a team called Chelsea, some foreign country. I don't know a lot about that. Nice. All right. Well, we're being recorded right now, uh, and so. All right. We have great instructors, one who is uh, – of experience and one is his very first time to present but he knows it inside and outside of this course so we're very lucky uh bob this is brian hartley go ahead sir <laughs> i uh had to change computers i apologize <laughs> no worries i i got you all squared away and we're going to be starting here about about three minutes i think Okay. Um, are you gonna? You're gonna start out with the screen share and put the uh, slides up, right? Uh, do you have the slides for chapter three, or do I have to come up with those? Ah, uh, I'm gonna have to. Oh shoot. Oh, it'll be okay, Brian. Don't worry. Um. Let me. Well, I had them. Um, well, I can walk you through it. No worries. Let me get let me get back to my email a second. Uh huh. Well, you may want to mute yourself. If you have trouble with your computer. We don't want to hear what language you know. So. Um. <laughs> oh shoot. 
Lars, way to go, Lars Adams. Who knows Lars Adams? Good job, Lars. All right, we've got a good turnout tonight. Right now our uh, program is being recorded, so that's pretty exciting. Okay, yeah. um, Bob, I just brought up the 2014 slide. Nice. All right, we're gonna walk you through the process of sharing them, which is no big deal. We're delighted that you're here to help share. Uh, so um, what'll happen is after you're done presenting, I'll pull out the uh, student study guide and one by one we'll go over all the questions with the students to see how they're setting with their knowledge. Uh, okay. But in the meantime, go ahead to um, the very bottom of your screen. Yeah. And uh, it should say share screen on the bottom. Can you see that there at the bottom? Just a sec here. Yep. So go ahead and left click on that. Okay, there it is. How are you, Carlson? Glad you could make it tonight. Hello, sir, how are you tonight? Good. Did you study you already with your review questions? I did the chapter three and chapter four. I read both chapters and I answered almost all the questions on chapter four. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, I'm, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, a good group here tonight. Um, do you see where it says share screen there at the bottom, Brian? Yep. So go ahead, left click on that. I did that. And um, I've got the, uh, I've got the um, course up here on the, in that little box. Well, a box. Well, for some reason, uh, it is not displaying. And you should be able to see that. So uh, there you go. Ah, ah, nicely done, sir. So where is it here? Open with. Go ahead, click on open with. And then it's Google Slides. Left click there. Because for some reason, I'm not seeing the whole. Can you kind of slide your, uh, your display up a little bit so then we can see the whole slide? Or is it letting you do that? Mm. Hmm. No worries. We'll figure it out. No stress. But, uh, nope. Well, shoot. No worry. You want to close it and try opening it again, maybe? Or do you want to just... Scroll over what it says, the little di diamonds on there, or little dots. Where it says more? Um, no, on the display itself. Oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. There, we go. there you go. And so now um, go up to, say, click got it, so that annoying thing goes away. See where it says got it, reply. Mm -hmm. And then up a little bit, it says slide uh, to the right there a little bit. A little bit right. Yeah, see where it says slide? Left click on that. And it should be from the, no, this isn't what I thought it was. Never mind, close that. Go over to file, and the, oh, here it is. I'm sorry, the very top. Sorry about this. Over, see where it says share in the upper right? Down, to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. See where it says present? Present, see, left, 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 down, down, present. P-R-E-S-E-N-T, no, no. I'm not showing that. Scroll over to your right just a wee bit. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Stop, left click. No, you moved again. <laughs> down, down, stop, stop. All right, left click. Are you left clicking? Well. Down a little bit, left click. Still nothing, huh? Bob, maybe he's got to be on that down arrow. Yeah. Oh, okay, go to the right. Hold on just a second. Let me get this moved out of the way. It's hard when you get the pictures on top of it to see what you're actually doing. Yeah. Yeah, from the beginning. Present from the beginning. To the left. Left click on that bad boy. We should be in business. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, sir. So this is going to be unit three. 
And uh, our next presenter, tell me a little bit about, more about yourself, Brian. You're in which division and which flotilla? Um, my name is Brian Hartley, and I am in Division 3107. Uh, we're the Grand Valley Flotilla. And uh, we work with and we're the, the Grand Haven Division. And uh, as you all know, they asked me to serve as the DSO MT. So I'm delighted we have somebody from uh, the Division 31 presenting tonight. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can use the chat function. And I will get those questions and I can answer those. But at this time, I'd like to welcome, let's give a warm Auxiliary Patrols welcome to our presenter, Brian Hartley. Yay, thank you everybody. Uh, well, let's get started. Thank you, Brian. As, as everybody know, I'm going to... Hey, Bob. Uh, go there? ahead, Brian. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I got to get to um, Chapter 3 here. All right. I, tr uh, I tried clicking on the Unit 3, but it yeah. didn't do anything. Well, just keep on clicking, I guess. Right. This will be a <laughs> review for everybody. <laughs> It's going to be a fast one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a speed reading. So, well, reading. what we can do while I'm doing this is um, most of you know what the kind of different kinds of patrols that we do out there, right? Anybody have any uh, questions about, about that before we get going? Well, Brian, one question Carlson had is if his vessel uh, has uh, the national ensign on the stern, uh, what is, do you know the rule about putting the, uh, the auxiliary ensign there on the, uh, where do you place that? Just keep going. Oh, you got it. Okay. never mind. Well, Ignore my uh, question. You can answer that later. You're ready to go and we got to get moving. Okay, okay sir. I say I usually, I put it up on my radio mast. Very good. All right. Chapter three. Okay. <laughs> Safety patrols. Um, now we call them uh, Marine observation missions. Of regatta patrols, aids navigation, chart updating patrols, SAR call outs, uh, disaster patrols, and port security. These all um, are the things that, you know, according to Coast Guard policy and auxiliary policy, that we're allowed to do. Um, and the um, usually what you know, and people will go out, they'll do a MOM, a Maritime Observation Mission. And in that time, we can, you know, a lot of people, uh, our guys included, because we have a number of aid verifiers, we'll also, you know, if we didn't do an actual um, AIDS navigation, one, uh, we'll check AIDS while we're out there, you know, depend, and sometimes the uh, station will also say, Hey, can you check this and you know get back to us with it? So we'll do that. Um, the and also on the marine observation, we're may, mostly out there, you know, also for the public to see us and ask questions and want to get applications to join the auxiliary. You guys, anybody ever have that? Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Cool. It's best to carry flyers and cards and a bunch of items with you so you can hand them out if necessary. Right. Yep. Have you ever had anybody ask you, <laughs> since when did the Coast Guard start using such, you know, irregular boats? Hmm. Nobody. Okay. We've had, we've had a few because we've had... Uh, in our flotilla, we had, before he uh, jumped ship, went to the other side of the state, had a nice 40-foot sailboat that we had for patrols. And they say, wow, you know, and so we got a chance to talk with them. Uh, we're also, you know, like I said, the Marine Observation Mission, we're out there to keep, a, you know, we'll uh, just assist with the Coast Guard and, um, you know, maybe answering people's questions if they, if somebody does have a problem, it's something that we can assist with. You know, there are, um, we can assist. There's, I don't know if we've uh, gone over that part yet um, about the come-upons 
Has has that been talked about yet? You know, we come up with somebody who's just sitting there trying to get their boat started and come to find out they just ran out of gas and they need to tow back to the back to the fuel dock. No, go ahead and tell us about it. Well, um, <laughs> this has always been quite a uh, sketchy uh, and debated topic is that um, the, even though our operations policy manual and the Coast Guard Auxiliary Manual all says that, you know, you do a come upon and they haven't made contact with the Coast Guard or anybody yet, you can go ahead and assist if you feel that you can do it safely. Now, um, the other caveat to that is, is letting the order issuing authority, you know, the whoever, you know, approves your orders, let that station know what you're doing. Um, it isn't so that they can jump in and say no, but they still do have, um, you know, some say in this. And I, I do know that um, here in Division 31, a couple of the stations that we've had, the um, OIC has really, really wanted to know <laughs> what was going on. And, you know, that, you know, they didn't come and read about something on Monday morning that happened Friday afternoon. And then if there's some kind of uh, banging up on a boat or something that they're putting in for damages, that's, this is why, you know, we want to keep them informed of what's going on. Because as you know, bad things can happen in a heartbeat. So, you know, when you're out there, just keep the station uh, informed of what's, what, uh, what you have going on. The um, other part of the Marine um, observation mission can simply be too that you notice some kind of um, possible illegal activity and you may have to contact somebody. Now you can contact uh, the station, which is preferred. Uh, you also, may, you know, have to call 911, you know, contact the local authority, uh, you know, but you want to keep yourself out of danger as well, okay? Don't enter into something that, you know, could quite possibly have somebody draw a weapon on you. Uh, one of the things that I'd read about here a couple of years, well, gosh, maybe it's been about uh, eight or nine years ago, is that the, there was a belief that um, a couple of the lakes in Michigan, they were doing um, meth labs, you know, on board the boat. So, you know, you, we're not law enforcement. Uh, another patrol, the regatta patrols, uh, these are more formal. This is where you'll have um, maybe a sailboat regatta or a powerboat regatta race of some sort. And these are ones that they have to apply for permits. Um, go they usually have to go through the station and or the order, you know, the order issuing authority for that area. Uh, one, I can give you one in particular, the fireworks um, patrols that we do for Coast Guard Festival. And that is, you know, they, uh, the company that does the fireworks, they have to go through the DNR and they also have to go through the city. They have to go through the Coast Guard. And, you know, all of this is at least a 30 day, what, you know, a 30 days in advance. And then with that too, you will have um, a more formal type of command system. So what this is how it works on Coast Guard Festival. There is the auxiliary, the Coast Guard, the Ottawa County and Allegan County Sheriff's Department along with the DNR. And usually they have what's called the PATCOM or the Patrol Command. And in the case of the fireworks and also for the parade of ships, the PATCOM is a Coast Guard individual. He's uh, usually E6 bosun's mate or E7, and they all follow also the incident command system. You know, 
they not only are they PATCOM, but that person can also be the incident commander. And with that, with that patrol, you know, they'll have more things written up prior to the event. So they'll have where the uh, units are gonna be posted and what your duties and responsibilities will be. So any questions about that? The another thing with the patrol command is that the patrol commander, he'll also, or she, that person will also be the one that's gonna say, hey, Ox 076, we need you to move, you know, move a hundred yards uh, up river, you know, and help with the congestion up there and so on. Uh, and then the uh, Ox, the patrol command will also be, the PATCOM will also be the ones that'll terminate the patrol. You know, so you'll wait for them to clear you off the scene. In the case of the um, fireworks, we're usually, when we do that, uh, they're usually done probably around 11 o'clock and then uh, we're out of the area. We hang around the area till probably almost midnight before they release us to head, head back to Port Sheldon. So the, we wait for the patrol commander. Um, if it's only a, um, if they're only using all auxiliary facilities, they'll have what's called an OXCOM. And that then somebody will be from an auxiliary could actually be the auxiliary command. And they fulfill this nearly the same function as the uh, patrol commander. And the only difference is, is your auxiliaries. Um, and with, with these regattas and these public displays, we want to remember, again, we're not law enforcement. We can ask people politely to, hey, you can't, um, we need you to have, move your boat X amount of yards away. And usually they do it. You know, you got your red and yellow light going. They respect that to some degree. And also they'll, um, you know, they may ask you, well, where, where else can I go? And so these are, and you're gonna wanna know where these staging areas for these people can be so that they're not in the way and not causing a hazard, especially if it's a race of some sort. Questions? Okay, moving on. Um, Oh, there's a number, there's also, there's powerboat regattas and sailboat regattas. Um, the, I don't know how many people were around when back in the mid, mid 80s, they were doing the American Powerboat Association races off Grand Haven. Um, that was one, um, I was on a, I was on a, a rescue boat. Uh, I'm a paramedic and I was also on a rescue boat. The problem was, is the guy that he's, you know, they were using volunteers. He, it's only a second day with his boat and he really didn't know how to operate it. So the problem, and he didn't have all the required safety equipment. And I have to say, we're glad that this thing got cut short before anything bad happened. So make sure that your crews are familiar with your boats, where all the stuff is. You don't wanna be doing it on the morning of. Now I do know that sometimes you'll get people, hey, I've never crewed here before, but take the time to learn it. Um, sailboat races, they run more of a triangle than they do an open course. And they'll, they may, um, they'll have turn, they can have buoys uh, or they may have turn boats where, you know, the, the sailboats will turn. That, that kind of stuff is all provided by the organization. It's their responsibility to put the buoys out and the uh, course markers. And if they're having rescue boats <coughs> and um, turn boats and such, then it's, they, um, then it's their responsibility. You know, what we're there for is to keep, help keep um, the spectators out of the race area, okay? 
Ace navigation and chart updating. How many uh, aid verifiers do we have out there? Am I still on? Oh, you're doing good. You know, it might be easier because <laughs> to keep it from getting a lot of static, like you can hear, I got some static on my radio. I will, I won't ask the people to turn their cameras on, but you see where it says on the bottom of the screen there, reactions? I'll ask him to give you a thumb, thumbs up. I don't know if you can see it on the bottom there. Reactions? Um, yeah, I don't see that. Oh, you know, I think that's just for the, 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 uh, the Oh, students. wait a minute. But they can put thumbs up on there if they have a, a if you have a question and they say yes. Okay. Otherwise, you could ask them to stop muting because to make it easier, I ask everybody to mute and turn their video off. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, AIDS, so, AIDS navigations, um, uh, um, safety patrols, we got, or, moms and regattas uh, those all have a uh, a spot in ox directory or not ox i'm sorry in uh, ox data um, as does chart updating and aid aid uh, ace navigation so this is i i like the aids navigation ones when we're doing aid verifier because it does help sharpen my skill of making sure these buoys um, are where they're supposed to be. So it helps my navigation skill. Um, I know that, you know, most people have some kind of electronic chart on their boats. Um, I still go, I'm old school because right now I just can't afford a very expensive chart plotter and stuff. Uh, but I do like chart work. And um, so when you're out there doing ACE navigation work, and chart updating, there's, you wanna make sure that you get as accurate as you can get. Um, so if you're able to get right next to a buoy and check its GPS location, that's great. You know, and making sure that you convert it either from decimal to minutes and seconds or minutes and seconds to decimal. Uh, what you're gonna to have to do is come out at one, some point and it has to be decimal because that's how it is listed in the light list, okay? Uh, that's another patrol and, um, get, and again, you know, while you're out doing that, you're just keeping your eyes open for other things because you may have to, you may hear, you know, somebody went missing off of a boat, you might be the closest thing to that area. And if, and if that is true, please make sure you contact, you know, your, OIA so that you know they have a they you know know that you're headed that you're out there you know and want to and hopefully you can assist <clears throat> okay uh, SAR call out the SAR call out is where um, the station may say I'm putting you on standby and um, because we're working a, uh, right now we're working an overdue and we're only in the uncertainty phase. And, but have your, you know, if you guys can be here at the station or maybe at the ramp or at a dock, you know, then um, you'll be on what's called SAR call out. And that's where you haven't moved yet, but you know, you're, not really going out and doing anything just yet. So if you want to keep your OIAs happy, just let them, you know, do what they say and let them know what you're doing and check in. Make sure you check in on, you know, whatever time schedule that they set, for, set out there. Uh, disaster patrols. These can be a little tricky. I've talked with some people that were, um, had some experience down in Katrina. Is there anybody out there who was who has done a disaster patrol? Okay. Um, so obviously you will not be out there in the coming day. You may they may say, hey, 
you know, we've got six days before this thing hits landfall. For the first two days, we're going to, you know, try and go out and help people get evacuated. Once the storm hits, I'm hoping that you're just hunkered down and not trying to ride out a uh, Category 4 hurricane in a, you know, 18 to 24 foot boat. That just has bad written all over it. Uh, so afterwards, you know, you may be asked and tasked with, you know, going into certain areas, helping evacuate people, finding out what there might be some sort of um, danger area. And I'm not saying you're going to go into it. A lot of times they'll say, these are the items that we're looking at for possible danger area. And part of that can be um, places where you know, boats have been ripped from their docks. There's floating debris. So when you're doing that stuff, these are things that you really need to watch for, especially the floating debris. Uh, this can be very dangerous. You can hit something and not even see it. And um, so they, that is another type of patrol, but it'll be after the storm. Uh, they'll they may still help, you know, hey, we've got to move X amount of stuff from point A to point B. And if you're able, if your facility can do that, your crew, they may have you do that kind of stuff as well. And that's all under the disaster patrols. I have not done one. I'm going to be, you know, all I know is what I've read and what I've heard from other people. So um, port security patrols, the um, those patrols and um, where you know you're in the harbor area how many how many guys were going to be um, doing patrols what was it um, well last year in Chicago before uh, you know, all the shutdown when they were going to do the uh, National Republican or was it the Democrat um, thing. Okay. So harbor security, port security are ones that, you know, you're kind of looking for and documenting and notifying these, these places about, um, you know, hey, I saw this type of vessel. Um, they were, you know, kind of looked a little odd. They were just sitting outside the um, harbor area or, you know, we, we saw three, um, three vessels come up and just kind of tie off and made it so that we couldn't get anything in or out of the Chicago harbor or uh, out of the Chicago uh, river. Um, other port security would be, um, if you're again seeing what may be illegal activity you know the old adage see something say something and usually with these port security patrols uh you'll be coordinating with you know the order issuing authority whoever that may be and they may say hey we want you to make contact with us via their cell phone not via radio Harbor observation, um, marine safety observation patrols. Uh, these again are ones that, um, you know, you may, and they kind of work in with pollution patrols as well. Um, ones that you will say, um, have, uh, Say there's a oil pollution slick or a oil pollution slick, a um, an oil slick out there. Uh, you may be asked not so much as to put a boom down, but to help keep you know other boats out of there. And remember, um, pollution patrols and some of these uh, harbor marine safety patrols uh, could end up being hazmat problems. And um, there's a whole big deal about, you know, what your qualification is be in getting into hazardous materials. 
Um, most of us are at the hazmat awareness stage. There's not, I don't know, there might be a few firefighters out there or um, people who actually work in the chemical area that might be um, technicians and such. But generally speaking on our boats, though at least most of the ones I know about, we don't have the personal protection equipment to get too involved in pollution and hazmat um, incidents. We can report it, let them know what we believe, how big we believe it may be. And believe me, that can be misleading, um, you know, and, but stay out of it. Uh, you don't know, sometimes you just don't know what that, what's in there other than oil. Uh, log just so, um, and again, keep in contact with, you know, whoever your command is. Uh, logistic patrols, those are ones that you're helping uh, move items or personnel from point A to point B. Uh, you know, I know that uh, just a, for instance, a number of years ago, uh, one of the aircraft did a logistics patrol. Uh, they flew some parts for a couple of boats from, uh, from Milwaukee to Traverse City. And then uh, Station Charlevoix, you know, sent somebody to get the stuff. And it can be the same way with a boat. You know, um, they could be that you were asked to help transfer um, personnel from, uh, from shore to, uh, well, like what we did for the fireworks. We took the uh, district commander, the group, or group captain, the uh, sector captain, and moved them from the station to their seating place at the fireworks. So that was a logistics patrol too. Um, another one could be that you're gonna take like a marine safety officer who has to do an inspection on um, a barge. You know, you may, they may ask you to take them out, you know, if your facility is able from uh, Grand Haven to six miles offshore, you know, to a barge. That's another logistics patrol. So, um, but a, a lot of these that, you know, you can add in all sorts of stuff while you're doing, while you're underway. The prob sometimes the problem comes in though, is when you're trying to enter this stuff into aux data. And then now that we have aux data two, that gives a whole new meaning to the word um, frustration sometimes when you're trying to get some of this stuff in. So my advice would be when you're doing, when you're gonna do something, pick a category and stick with it, unless it absolutely has to change. For your patrols, you, ha you also have to operate under orders. So you guys are all familiar with what um, reimbursable, non-reimbursable orders are? Some of the newer members who are just taking this course may not be. Okay, all right. Well, when we're underway under orders, it can be either non re <coughs> excuse me, non reimbursable or reimbursable. Um, reimbursable, what those orders are is that uh, you may get reimbursed. Uh, the owner of the op of the facility or they may pay it to the coxswain and then he distributes or she. Um, the, like for my boat, I trailer mine. So I actually can get a uh, trailering reimbursement and it's whatever the government um, has determined what that mileage is. They do it per mile on that. Um, they also do a fuel and oil reimbursement. Um, I, that, and the, on the um, 5312, they, there's a spot for where you will um, put, you know, kind of itemize. Um, I think the district is, the district policy is if it's under $75, we don't have to do a receipt. Is that correct, Bob? For like fuel? 
Uh, I think in this class they said it's under 25. Okay. Yeah, I know in the in the in the uh, Ox book here it's it's under 25. So, but I do know that um, there was a change in District Nine here a number of years ago, but I can't. I don't know what that. I don't remember what that is. So, um, anything under 25. Five bucks does not require a receipt. Anything over does. So you want to make sure that you keep your receipts. Um, and they will, it's been my experience that they've accepted copies. Keep your receipts. <laughs> because I can just, I can tell you, they'll send back and say, hey, we need a copy of that receipt. So don't, uh, don't throw them out after you've sent it in. Um, and then, so those are reimbursable orders. Uh, they may also do a per diem, which could be that, you know, we're going to do X amount of dollars for a meal per member, who, boat crew member. And, but you have to have a patrol that's scheduled to go for a certain amount of time. Um, I think it's got to be at least six hours. Um, I did, I did not see anything in the Oxpat class about that. But I think that's a District 9 policy. And then non-reimbursable orders are ones that you're just not going to get reimbursed for. Um, you can still do the patrol. Uh, and there may be, you know, you may say, hey, you know, call the station. I've got um, a full complement crew here. We're just out fishing, but if you need need us, we can you know, we we can help you out. So those may be what they call um, kind of an emergency order, a verbal order, or a quick written order, and they will you know, chances are you won't be used, but who knows? Something happens right in front of your face, then you know they'll they'll do it up. Is that, um, is that like pocket orders? I'm sorry? Is that like pocket orders? I have no, I don't know that term. I think it's pretty much what you're talking about, I think. Okay. I, I've not heard that before, but uh, probably. So um, have, and, and like, a, it does not hurt to make, you know, to submit your claim, you know, they just may say, Hey, we're not paying for that. Okay. Um, also, uh, there is a uh, procedure if there's damage and not everything that gets damaged on patrol is automatically covered. Um, it's a pretty lengthy, uh, process. And, um, I know a couple of years ago, just, you know, we put a little dingus in my boat, but you know what? That came from, that just came from, you know, not having the fender in the right spot at the right time. However, a little bit of elbow grease and a little bit of paste fixed her right up. Uh, if you get hurt on a patrol, um, here, you know, they talk about mishap. So, or you don't even have to get hurt. Um, I slipped on the dock once, went down on my butt. And um, at that time, I didn't know I had to uh, uh, do anything if there was no injury. So about three minutes, or three minutes, about uh, three weeks later, uh, Mr. Hinkin calls me up and wants a, uh, wants a statement of what happened. I said, well, I fell and bounced off my butt, <laughs> you know, and it, it, it covers both sides. It covers the Coast Guard and it covers you. Even though I wasn't injured, they still want to have what happened, you know, and, and how to prevent it from happening. I said, well, don't put docks around water so they get slippery. He didn't think that was funny either. So, Okay. Quick question Questions on, on these things, anybody? I've got two. Hello, uh, 
Brian? Well, yeah, go ahead. Mike McGann here on uh, pollution, pollution patrol. If we're out on uh, patrol and uh, you see a boat discharging oil or gas, what is our uh, exact uh, procedure to tell them what? To go I, back to shore or what do we tell you know, them? If they're, if they're out there and I would, I think I would make contact first. Now, I've never had this happen, uh, but I have heard, you know, what uh, some of the guys from Marine Safety Grand Haven had said, if you can make contact and it's not a, you know, getting into an argument, um, ask them first, do you know this is happening? You know, they may say, yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they might be able to correct the problem. Uh, get the register if you can get the registration numbers of the boat. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're able to get the operator's name and address and telephone number, you know, do that. Um, and then I contact the station just as soon as you can, because depending on how much is out there, they may have to boom it off. And you know, this poor guy could be on the hook for quite a bit of money, you know, because and it isn't just. Um, you know, uh, the Coast Guard, but, you know, it's the Michigan D, well, I, I'm going to use Michigan DNR right now, if you don't mind. Uh, Michigan DNR, it's the um, EPA, everybody's going to want to get their hooks into the, into some, some of this because they see a lot of insurance money coming their way. But um, also, though, this might be a good time to break out the binoculars. And, you know, if you can sketch an area um, about, you know, and I'm not saying anybody has to be an artist, but sketch an area of how much, you know, how much area this pollution might be covering. And again, don't get in it, you know, if you can, you know, stay out of it. So if you're, if you're having to stay out of it, then you're going to want to just, and you're able to get the registration numbers of the boat. Also, if you can, um, if you're able to take a picture, that would be very helpful, especially if there's a name on the boat and you can get the name of the boat on in the picture and, you know, they can, uh, that's another way to help identify. Um, but, you know, if it looks like there's going to be a big argument or some kind of aggressive behavior, then don't remember we're not law enforcement so just back off call the station let them know what you have yeah but we're legally we can take a picture no invasion of privacy nothing like that i mean they probably be maybe getting a little upset if someone's taking a picture of them yeah they might be uh they're in the public you know uh you don't have you don't actually have to take a picture of the person even though, you know, if you could discreetly do that, but yeah, I got gotcha. Yeah. You know, um, but you know, you want to try and, you know, get as much information of that boat that you can. And like I said, you know, maybe if you approach it and say, Hey, sir, do you know that, you know, they're, you're dumping all sorts of crud into the lake? Cause he may not know it, you know, it's possible. Okay, gotcha. Thanks, Brian. Okay. But what here's what I would do is before well, when the season starts, go to your order issuing authority and ask them for help on those kind of situations. Find out what they would like from you to do. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else? Two questions. Go ahead. John Robertson, 3906. Um, one minor. That student study guide for OxPAT says that receipts have to be signed by the vendor. True or false? Okay, I'm sorry. Try that again. The study guide for OxPAT says that receipts from the vendors to be reimbursed have to be signed. Is that, is that minutia? I mean, does that people follow that letter? Um, the only time, do you mean that the vendor has to sign it? it? The guides, I don't want to get way into the weeds here, but the guide says that the receipts have to be signed. So, 
Bob? Yeah, no, I think these days with the printouts, but I think the best thing to do before you go on a patrol, if you're curious about this, ask your order issuing authority what their policy is. National guidance, I guess, is they're supposed to, but uh, uh, Brian, do you usually have them sign or you just get the receipt out of the machine? I usually just get the receipt out of the machine. And if I have to, uh, and I don't have, because my boat's trailerable, so I fill it up at, the, at a gas station. And I've never had an issue with um, sending my receipt in. I make sure my name is on it and I initial it. I wonder if that might be what they're, because I've never had an issue with that. And, no, I just, I think they're probably trying to verify that you actually did get it. Like, I don't know what somebody would handwrite a receipt. Maybe, I don't know. But as long as it's got, you know, <laughs> shell station or whatever printed right on it, you can tell it came from a store. Yeah. But maybe I, Bob, an issue with the like I said, manual. I put my name on it because that's what I have to do to work too to get reimbursed on stuff. And, you know, I've, and I've sent my stuff in and I've never had an issue with it. My, my Somebody bigger, else? Bob and Brian? My yeah. Who is that? All right, food. hold on, hold on, and, guys. One at a time. Okay. This is Patrick. I can add a little clarity to that uh, fuel. Okay. Um, there are some marinas where people have accounts. And so that's why they were looking for a separate issue. Oh. Because we, we had that at certain uh, marinas on, on the on the lakefront, like Belmont at one time. They, people had accounts there. And, um, and if you buy off of a Coast Guard account, which they sometimes allow, of course, your order issuing authority has to give you the okay. You have to get make sure you get a, a signed agreement, a signed receipt. Pardon me. Right. Good. Any other questions about that? Anybody else got any more questions for Brian? The more important question, and we can move on, is why, why would the OIA issue orders, but not make them reimbursable. And I'm thinking about six bucks a gallon aviation fuel or boat fuel. Well, I know from the aviation side, you know, we had the opportunity to participate in certain things, but uh, they said because of the budget right now, we can't compensate you. And there was, there was guys that uh, would fly security patrols, you know, when they had budget crises in Washington or whatever, just cause it was uh you know, during the Mac race or whatever a few years ago, but yeah, but people will do it. I mean, uh, I don't know how common it is, but uh, I know on the aviation side years ago, we did it. Um, I can honestly tell you that um, from what I know about unreimbursable orders, um, that I've never had that with boat movement but we've had that with other um, things like we had some people that were trying to get some of their aviation quals in so they can become observers and such and even though they they didn't get reimbursable orders to um to the school for um oh the uh, egress and uh the uh crew um resource management classes that they still they just went on their own dime and they then they were given orders so that they would at least be covered traveling to and from and while they're in the class even though they weren't going to get reimbursed for it and that's for liability purposes right as far as for boat movement um i have not run into that situation you know we've um so I, I guess I just don't have a really hard and fast answer for you. Okay. That's fine. It's just out of personal interest. I'm sure other people want to. But no, on. I, you know, I get it. You know, like you said, gas is edging up towards $6 a gallon and, you know, they want us to play and help them out, you know. Well, those are good questions. We are kind of getting squeezed on time a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alrighty. If, um, if. Operational training patrols. Um, these, these again, um, like last year, you know, last summer, that, that was a big issue because of the COVID. Uh, so, you know, you're going to, 
you'll get underway, you'll do your uh, risk assessment, your GAR 2.0, and um, these are ones where you have trainees aboard. Of course, when we go out, we take as many tra trainees as we can all the time, you know, because the season is so short. So training patrols um, are ones, maybe you've got an opportunity for an afternoon of two boat training, either with the Coast Guard or another auxiliary unit. Um, same rules will apply. You uh, make sure that you put in for the orders. Uh, coxswains will, um, you know, go in and request the orders. And then, uh, you know, they got to make sure that, um, as with all of these, you got to have the qualified, the minimum qualified crew. So if your boat is a 20 footer, you only need two people. But if you're training, I often felt you needed a third person plus one trainee. You know, um, you, you got to decide how many people you're going to stuff on a boat. You know, uh, patrol. So or I'm going to stick with operational training here for a few minutes. Uh, that These are ones where, you know, we're um, maybe we're doing um, Search patterns, we could be doing toes, person in the water, man overboard. Um, but when you, when you log this to Ox data, I was told, and I, don't, I'm, I don't know if this is true now anymore, that you don't get these operational training patrol hours don't count towards sustained um, service award hours and that you should put it under marine observation mission. Is there any truth to that, Bob? Do you know? That, I don't have the answer for that. So again, okay. they should ask their order issuing authority. Okay. On, on the air side, that's absolutely true. We don't ever do a training patrol, even if it's assigned as that. Um, if you have a two hour patrol, first 15 minutes might be training because that's assuming that everybody on the vessel or on the, in the airplane is a trainee, which is obviously is not correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, this is what, and this is what we've always done with ours been Marine observation missions, you know, so that those hours get counted towards the uh, sustain. I personally believe every hour we spend should be going towards that, but okay. Uh, patrols assisting other agencies. Um, we did this, uh, our flotilla did this with uh, Muskegon County Marine Division. They had some uh, really young and new people. Our first training mission with them was um, doing, um, doing some chart work. You know, I was amazed at the Marine Division and how many people didn't know how to read a chart. And then the next was we got out on the boats. Um, we actually took them to buoys and you know showed you know and got them to see what they looked like, uh, not on paper, and you know the thing you know some of the different characteristics of them because they go flying past them but they don't have a good idea of what they do. Uh, also, another thing with assisting other agencies, um, I know that. Uh, on one, one uh, patrol, this is quite a few years ago, they actually um, had a DNR officer along with a Coast Guard boarding officer on, on board a auxiliary boat. And um, they, what was happening is, is that there was some fishing issues um, down off of Grand Haven. And they, um, all they did was take these guys to the area and they had met up with, um, you know, another, uh, the, uh, another DNR boat. And, you know, they, they went on there and doing their thing. So uh, those are other ways of having other, assisting other agencies. Another one can be um, uh, DTE or uh, one of the pipelines that they may ask, hey, we're gonna do some soundings and they may go to the Coast Guard or, you know, and the Coast Guard could say, hey, 
you know, we can get the auxiliary to shuffle you guys around out there. You know, again, you're not doing law enforcement, but you are assisting another agency. Okay. Um, so we did the, uh, remember most of your patrols will be under official orders. And the, the one marked in red reimbursable is the one we go after first. Uh, so, okay. Um, reimbursable orders are now issued through the auxiliary order management. Now it's through uh, Ox Data 2. Okay. Um, boating, you know, we talked about safety patrols and uh, Coast Guard boating safety mission. Is there any of this stuff you guys don't, uh, that you don't understand? Well, if you want to just hit the high points, a lot of them are uh, fairly new. Okay. All right. Um, you know, again, our boating safety patrols, this is a big one. Uh, we, we're out there, we're visible. Uh, we, in support of the Coast Guard's boating safety mission, you know, um, there may be somebody's got their kid sitting out on the stern of the boat while it's moving down the channel, you know, and you can just very politely and professionally say, hey, you know, you may want to bring that youngster in, you know, and get a life jacket on them before they end up in, you know, getting injured. Um, the crew is listed in the operations policy manual. Um, you'll see where it says coxswain plus one plus for facilities less than 26 feet. Um, that's a minimum, okay? And then for facilities 26 to 40, three people, Facilities 40 to 65, four, okay? And facilities 65 feet and over, at least five. Uh, assistance may be um, provided in accordance with the Coast Guard Maritime Assistance and Salvage Policy. Do you guys, do you guys know that the Coast Guard routinely does not do salvage, correct? Yep. Yep. They, yep. now, to say that they won't tow somebody um, is uh, they will, um, you know, and they'll usually tow it to the nearest safe haven. Uh, maybe, you know, we'll give fuel oil, fuel and oil, um, a battery boost. Uh, I don't have that on mine. Um, tools for repairs. I have tools, but I don't know if I could fix it for them. <laughs> Oh, it, um, here's the thing that may or may not happen that auxiliaries would transition from safety patrol to recreational boating out, uh, outings. You know, let's say, hey, we're gonna do, um, we're gonna be on Muskegon Lake. We'll do, we'll do say um, four hours of patrol in the afternoon, but we wanna watch the sunset interrupted. So at eight o'clock, we're going to, um, terminate, you know, we're going to request orders for up to eight o'clock. Then we want to watch sunset. Uh, when that is done, then you take all of the patrol items off the, off the boat, you know, and stow them. That's the sign boards, the patrol ensign. You can replace it with the blue one. Take off the uniforms um, and also the Coast Guard PFDs and put on your civilian ones. Okay, now uh, we'll get back to, let's say that you um, get, um, you know, they call and say, hey, we need help. Can you help us? Get dressed, get, a, get your stuff back on as quickly as you can. Or if it's one of these things where, hey, you know, we can't, uh, we got to get going. We don't have time to get our clothes back on. Put your PFD on and if somebody, if there's a, an issue, heartbreak with it later, then, you know, you can deal with it. But just, you know, for every day we're done with the patrol, this stuff's got to be taken off. Uh, facility begins patrol by checking the uh, patrol sector. Uh, so like ours, you know, we'll do, we do a lot on Muskegon Lake. Uh, well, I like to get in at the state park. They have a real nice ramp. And so we'll cruise the lake and get an idea of what's going on. 
uh, see what the local weather is like, um, see if there's any, you know, things out there that floated down the Muskegon River that's into the, into the lake. Um, be re you know, keep an eye out on, on the weather. Be, make sure that you know what the weather forecast is going to be and just keep your eye on for, for changes. Um, broadcast only observe current weather conditions. If the station's asking you just what is happening, don't go into a broadcast. Okay. Um, check the local age navigation uh, on Muskegon Lake. There's a lot of them. Um, that could be a whole patrol in and of itself. Uh, when you, you know, if you see something that's not right on an Aton, document the discrepancies and notify the station. Uh, let's see, observe Coast Guard maritime assistance and salvage policy. You know, we, we came up to the, uh, you know, we talked about the come upon. You know, you're out there, you just came upon somebody that needs, you know, you don't have gas to give them, but you can tow them to the dock. Again, make sure they haven't uh, made contact with the guard, with the Coast Guard or another salvage or towing company so that they can, um, you know, and make sure you can do it, you know. Um, we don't, and again, we don't do salvage. So if they ran that boat hard aground, my recommendation to any auxiliarist, because most of us don't have the facilities, nor the equipment, and probably the training to refloat a boat that was put hard aground. You know, if you think that it's dangerous for the people on board, try to get them off without going aground yourself. And, you know, notify the station of what's happening and then take guidance from the officer of the day or the uh when the boat gets underway the coxswain okay um and then you know at the end of your patrol um obtain permission to secure you know usually it's back at the ramp okay We talked about marine regattas. So it's an organized event. The participant vessels and spectator vessels are involved, usually staged, you know, in a closed area. Like I said, they all, maybe it's a circle, maybe it's a, uh, a rectangle of sorts. So um, if you're involved there, you want to get as much information as they, they'll get, and they'll give out a lot. Uh, the sponsor makes the application to the Coast Guard 30 days or more prior. Uh, and then the Coast Guard determines if a patrol is needed. So they may say, yeah, we're not, for this one, we're not really going to put anything out there. Um, the sponsor is responsible for safety of the participant vessels. Okay. Not the spectators. They don't take responsibility for that. They take responsibility for the participant vessels. Uh, the patrol purpose is maintain spectator safety, again, by politely controlling the spectator craft. Uh, we talked about PATCOM, usually Coast Guard. Marker vessels mark limits of restricted area, not turning points. Screen vessels may be moving or stationary. The screen vessels, those are the ones that are sitting there and they're trying to keep the spectator vessels out of the out of the safety and security zone. Here, here is a, uh, <clears throat> here is a um, diagram of a regatta, you know. So, and who knows, it doesn't necessarily always have to be speed. It can just be um, maybe a parade of sorts. But you'll notice, you know, the shoreline, restricted area, marker vessels, okay. Uh, patrol vessels, you stay in your sector, and then the PATCOM will move you if they want you to move. And also, uh, patrol vessels, patrol log booms, um, you know, that's, they keep those, that's another, maybe another way to help keep, um, you know, vessels away, you know, these, you know, they call them log booms, 
And if you look at them, sometimes they can look like uh, pollution booms too. Okay, then only PATCOM will terminate the patrol. Like I said, you know, like during the fireworks, um, we uh, had, um, we waited for PATCOM to say 44406, um, you're cleared back to Port Sheldon. You know, say thank you. Uh, rectangular or oval courses, uh, the escape valve. You want to know where this is so you can kind of stay away from that a little bit. This is if a boat doesn't think he's going to make that turn, that he'll just go straight and then come back. Um, whether they get whatever they get points or no points for that, I don't know, but that helps keep from uh, capsizing or from torpedoing. Um, minimal wake is important. Uh, again, uh, some of these hydroplanes, you know, they virtually fly across the water, and any type of little wake can send them from from uh, you know water level to thirty feet in the air, and sometimes they don't like that. Assist the participants only when requested. Uh, a lot of times they'll have their rescue boats and their people and they're trained and they have their stuff and they will, you know, do what they need to do. They may ask you for assistance, okay? Uh, consider the impact of noise it will have on the communications. It's gonna be noisy out there with some of this stuff, especially the big boats from the APBA um, I, you know, that's, this is where hand signals may help a lot. Um, if, uh, I don't know if you'd be able to have, um, you know, if you got portable radios with headsets or at least earpieces, maybe that could be a thought. Uh, okay. Sailboat regattas, uh, usually some form of triangle course, um, generally requires a moving screen. Um, Lake Mac has um, the um, Makatawa Yacht Club during the summer has uh, sailboat races every Saturday. And, uh, you know, I, you, they'll have it in a triangle type of area, big, big inflatable buoys, you know, they're cheap. They, they uh, don't take, you know, they don't uh, damage the boats. So that's why you see those. Some may be white, some may be orange. Assistance to participants may disqualify them from com competition. So always ask the skipper of a disabled boat before helping. And then the skipper usually knows the best way to assist. We're, Straight we're getting kind of pinched on time, Brian. So uh, we're only 10 minutes okay. over now, so yeah. Oh, all right. Um, so anyway, here's one of the big things is maintain no wake and, you know, keep your spectator vessels, you know, back out of the uh, safety and security zone. Okay. Um, the uh, group of vessels on parades, again, um, the amount of control may vary depending on how little, how big of an area and how many boats. All right, so I'm gonna kind of go, through, you know, I, I hit those pretty good. Um, Aton reports, we already talked about that. Uh, submit <laughs> um, the 7054, um, make sure that that is filled out correctly. Uh, there is an online, the electronic for that and um, you really don't need to do a 7030 anymore. The coxswain should be entering that stuff into aux data too. Okay. So um, we talked about ATON net um, chart updating reports. Um, these are ones that, you know, if there's discrepancies out there for the chart. So um, I would get with the order with the order issuing authority. And because that's what we do anyway, uh, find out what they want on there. Okay. Uh, same thing. So we talked about the disaster stuff. Okay. Are there any questions on patrols out there?
Sounds like they're good. Okay, Bob, you want to take a short break and then do your review? Uh, no, we can't. We, is this the last slide? Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, let's, okay. All right, well, go ahead on the bottom where it says stop sharing, or is it on the top on your screen? Maybe uh, the very top. Stop sharing? Yeah. I'm sorry, I got wordy. No, no. Uh, you know, you wouldn't get good stories like that anywhere else. And uh, and uh, we're sure happy to have you here today, Brian. Good stuff. Um, hey, Brian. Um, yes. I got a qu question for you. By the way, great presentation. Like I'll echo what Bob said, a lot of great material that you added into the text. Um, you mentioned uh, Brad Hankin. Uh, is he still in right now? Oh, no. Uh, Mr. Hankin retired. Um, when uh, Mr. Haslam took over. Okay. Um, last of my uh, recollection, he was up in, um, actually up in, he uh, actually bought a house up in Fremont. Now that's been a few years ago. I don't know where he's at now. He may not even be in Fremont, Michigan anymore. Okay. Yeah, maybe just, we could talk yeah. about that a little later. Uh, it's getting yeah, late well, some of our Michigan fans there. Patrick, go ahead and take question one here. Since the auxiliary is charting in 1939, one of the most important operational functions has been? Uh, what we've been talking about, regatta and safety patrols. Very good. Mike McGann, number two, safety patrols by the auxiliary directly support the Coast Guard mission of? You there, Mike? Uh, John Robertson, can you do number two? Safety patrols by the auxiliary directly support the Coast Guard mission of? Promoting boating safety. Right on. Number three, Mark Frankel, a properly executed patrol enhances the blank of both the Coast Guard, auxiliary, and the Coast Guard. Image. Outstanding. Or reputation. Drew Suss, number four, patrol for aids to navigation and chart updating purposes can obtain information for? You there, Drew? Number four? Uh, the Coast Guard. Uh, the actually information can be obtained both for the Coast Guard, but also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, it's A, right? Federal, state, and local agencies? Yes. Good. Number five, uh, Anita, safety patrols increase the opportunity for the boating public agencies responsible to obtain blank information. Boating safety, sea condition reports and navigation hazard notices. Excellent. Patrick Dubin, no, number six, Patrick Dugan. Uh, a principal purpose of safety patrols is to render assistance to a vessel. C, before it becomes the object of a search and rescue effort. Excellent. Elaine, uh, 37, when a safety patrol is suspended for a combined recreational outing, all patrol items? Must be removed. C. C, must be removed from public, well, no, it shouldn't be C, right? I said C. What I? would be a better answer? Ooh. I'm sorry, D. Yeah, good. Yeah. Very good. Next one. I would mean myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pat, uh, Pete Nofke, number eight here. The first duty of an auxiliary coxswain on a safety patrol is to know? To be C, Charlie, the area to be patrolled. Good. Uh, Justin Johnson, number nine. The minimum number of qualified auxiliarists, including the coxswain required as crew for a safety patrol is? Is it two? Two. Good. Jane Bickle, number 10, when a patrol unit arrives on station for a safety patrol, the blank must be notified. A district commander, is it? I'm going to go with cognizant Coast Guard stations. Does that oh, sound right, Brian? Yeah, I think they should have put in their order issuing authority. Good. Jane, uh, let's see. Who had that? That was you, Jane. Uh, Jessica McAllister, 11, to determine prevailing conditions and locations where trouble might develop, a patrol vessel arriving on station should? Uh, make a preliminary sweep of the area. Excellent. Good job. Carlson, number 12, when a patrol vessel is assigned an assistance mission, vessels in adjacent sectors should? That's Alpha. Move to the line between the two sectors. Right. Very good. Bob Mack, 13, the speed of a vessel on a safety patrol should be kept down. What was that? Is your question? Uh, no. Okay, uh, Bob Mack, 13, the speed of a vessel on a safety patrol should be kept down while patrolling to? Uh, C, enable the crew to keep a sharp lookout. Very good. Uh, next page, please. Um, 
Let's see, no, Jane already got John, uh, no. Deb Salvi, 14, during deteriorating weather, it is important that the coxswain. B, continue the patrol as long as possible without endangering the facility. Okay. Penny Ross, 15, an auxiliary patrol vessel reporting sea conditions to a broadcast station for retransmission must arrange with the station. Uh, that no auxiliary endorsement of any sponsor's product or services is implied. Excellent. 16, Kevin Karchow. Karchow, uh, an auxiliary vessel providing sea conditions must, uh, to the reports to the public, blank, include Maybe weather not. forecast. Yeah, don't forecast. Good. Gibbs 17, when uh, an auxiliary... I'm sorry, when the coxswain of an auxiliary vessel is considering whether to assist a disabled vessel, the Coast Guard policy regarding blank should not be overlooked. Yeah, it's a commercial assistant. Right, and you'll hear that a lot in Chicago because uh, Boat US does not want you helping people that are just out of fuel that don't really need an emergency assistance. Uh, RCA number 18, when the condition or location of any navigational aid is found to be in variance with the data on the chart, in the light list or in the local notice to mariners, the variance should be reported immediately to? Uh, see the coast, nearest Coast Guard unit. Excellent, let the Coast Guard know. Uh, has them, uh, number 19 here, when a patrol, when a safety patrol vessel encounters a navigational hazard but is unable to report it to the Coast Guard, it is appropriate to send a blank radio message to broadcast the particulars regarding the hazard. You there, Mark? Uh, C. Uh, did you say C or D? D. D is correct. Security, 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 large piling floating in the water here. Kevin Worthy, number 20. The proper action when the time arrives to terminate a patrol is to? Remember this one, Kevin? You with us, Kevin? Worthy? Paula Wicks, you want to take a crack at this one? Um, this is 20, um, request 20. permission to secure from the Coast Guard station, that's A. Correct, very good. Uh, I'm gonna jump around a little bit here. Uh oh no, I didn't want that. Mark Frankel, number 21, it is beneficial for all patrol vessels to rendezvous at the end of a patrol blank. Uh, B, to discuss the patrol and recommend improvements. Always getting better, very good. Anita number 22, during a regatta or marine parade, the safety of the participant vessels is the responsible of the? E, sponsoring organization. He is correct. Drew Suss 23, most regattas and marine parades are staged over blank court. Hey, straight line. Straight line, good. Or actually, you know, I think they're looking for clothes there, aren't Close. they? Close. Yeah. yeah, straight line. Sometimes the, the parades will be in an oval course, so it's they're looking for C. Uh, John uh, Puskar, number 24, a patrol craft assigned to a patrol sector will blank unless otherwise directed by the patrol commander. Charlie, move only within that sector. Stay in their zone. Very good. Patrick Dugan, 25, patrol vessels may be assigned as either blank vessels or blank vessels. C, marker or screen. I think what they were looking for was I think looking for stationary and moving. Yeah, I think they're looking for A on that one, Patrick. All right, 26. Uh, where are we? Elaine, uh, a patrol vessel assigned to indicate the limits of a restricted area is a blank vessel. D, marker. Marker is correct. Very good. Patrick Leonardi, 27. Vessels employed to indicate turning points for regatta, for regatta participants are provided by. Of the regatta sponsor. B is correct. Well done. Larry Lindbergh, 28. An auxiliary vessel may be used as either a blank or blank. You there, Larry? Stationary or moving screen. Good. 29. Uh, Mike McGann, auxiliary vessel serving as part of a moving screen maneuver between the blank and blank. You know this one, Mike? Pete Nofke, 29. No, number B. B, patrol vessels and participant. Oh, no. Uh -uh. No. 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 You want to try again, uh, Mike? Participant, spectator, participant, spectator, 
So C, yeah, C is correct. Good. Where am I? Justin, uh, number 30, during a patrol for a marine event, it may be necessary to use a sequence of floats or log boom if blank when a station or a section of the course must be closed. You there, Justin? Is it, sorry, I was muted. Uh, is it D, there's not enough, if there is not enough sufficient patrol vessels? Right. Uh, Jane Bickle, 31, when a log boom is used to restrict access to an area, it is the responsibility of blank to warn spectators of uh, obstructions. Of the sponsor, is it the sponsor or the patrol vessels? A long one is used to restrict access to an area. Um, I read that to believe the sponsor. The sponsor? All right, we're going to double check 31. Uh, Jessica McAllister, 32. Patrol vessels must be alert for weather changes, which might cause anchored spectator vessels to. Uh, Charlie, swing into restricted zones. Good. C. Uh, next one, uh, Carlson, 33, a powerboat regatta is generally held on a blank course. A uh, rectangular or oval? Good. Right. Bob Mack, 34, one of the prime responsibilities of patrol vessels during powerboat regatta is to keep wakes from spectator and patrol craft. You know this one, Bob? You there, Bob Mack? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I turned it off. It was on. Uh, I said uh, D to a minimum. D is correct. Good. John Robertson, 35. A powerboat race contestant may be blank if attempts to assist conflict with race regulations. Bravo, disqualified. Yeah, they can get kicked out. Good. Uh, Deb Salvi, 36. An auxiliary patrol vessel should not provide assistance to a contestant in a powerboat race unless requested to do so by. Alpha, the race committee with the approval of the PEPCOM. Should not provide assistance to a contestant. Uh, I thought it was B on this one. Uh, do you have to get approval from PEPCOM? You know this one, Brian? Yeah. I don't know this one. Yeah. It's not going to be a powerboat race, yeah. From What's the, the correct answer committee. you said? Alpha. The, what I read was it would have to be from the skipper not from the pit crew. Right, but I think what they're looking at here is actually gonna be B. 36, we gotta check that one. Penny Ross, 37, extensions yeah, to the to straight- that one. <laughs> okay. Extensions to the straight sections of a powerboat race course are known as? Escape valves. Escape yep. valves, good. Gibbs, 38, because of the high noise level of some powerboat races, special communication equipment such as blank or blank could be necessary. Charlie, traffic control signals and headphones. Good. Who else is left here? Penny Ross, uh, I'm sorry, Arcia Moss, 39. Sailboat races are usually run on a blank course. Uh, C, triangular. Very good, correct. Uh, Mark, uh, so uh, 40. The three different types of sailing legs on a sailboat regatta are the? Oh, we didn't hit that one very well. Run the reach and the beat. The beat. Run the reach and the beat. Good. Yeah, that was in your reading material. If you didn't see that, hopefully you looked it up. Uh, Kevin Worthy of there, 41. The most effective formation for patrol vessels during a sailboat race is the? You know this one, Kevin Worthy? I might have lost Kevin here. Paula Wicks, you want to take a crack at this one? Um. A moving screen, see. Moving screen, correct. Uh, Jessica McAllister, 42. The best location for patrol vessels during a sailboat race is blank of the participants. Downwind and astern. Downwind and astern, D, good. Uh, Anita Lutkis, 43. The best source for determining the preferred procedure for riding a capsized sailboat is? Be the skipper of the sailboat. Skipper himself, very good. Mark Frankel, 44, rowing regattas are held on a blank course. Straight. Straight, good. Uh, Patrick Leonardi, 45, crew members of vessels participating in rowing regattas seldom wear? Uh, personal flotation devices. 
Very good. Larry Lindbergh, 46, during the rowing regatta, the pro patrol vessels should ensure that spectator craft are in fixed positions well before the start of the race so that... Charlie, the wake-driven wave action will have subsided. Excellent. Uh, Alan, uh, loud hailing equipment should not be used during the patrol of a rowing regatta because the sound... Hey, will interfere with the rowing cadence. <clears throat> good. Uh, Mike McGann, 48, the best location for the patrol commander of a Marine Parade patrol is? There, Mike. C. I don't think that's what they're, I don't think that's what they're looking for. Uh, I, I would go with A. Yeah, with the event sponsor. Yeah. Good. They're usually in a stationary spot. Yeah, so, so yeah, 48 I did at one at one spot that uh, aboard an auxiliary uh, aircraft. Yeah, the maximum uh, visibility. Yeah, I, I oh, went yeah. to VC. I well, went what happens it. is if you have the patrol commander with the Marine par Patrol Parade, if he's with the event sponsor and the event sponsor says we want to halt the event for safety reasons, then he's able to respond right away. So it sounds like it'd be best to be up in an airplane, but know what they're looking for is in communication with the sponsors. So you, it should be in the book. And yeah, that's not what the book says. The book says, well, book says C. Oh, it does say C? All right. Well, you know what? If it says C, then that's the right answer. I bet. Uh, Justin, did I ask you? Good. C is. C is what they're looking for. Justin, yeah, number 49, uh, an application for approval of a uh, marine event must be prepared by the sponsor and submitted to the Coast Guard or local boating administration expect, except uh, at least blank days prior to the event. Is it C, 30 days? C is correct, good. Jane Bickle, 50, when a Coast Guard patrol commander is embarked aboard an auxiliary vessel, the blank is not displayed, but the blank is displayed. Say A. Oh. National yeah. Ensign, Coast Guard Ensign. Now what they're looking for here is uh, if you got a Coast Guard, a Coast, what's that? What's that, Jane? What's that, Jane? Auxiliary Ed, no, it's the, does it B? Yeah, yeah, they, it's the uh, Coast Guard officer's flag. Okay. Um, pretty, oh, you know what, maybe I've got that wrong. I no, got it should be. I'm oh, sorry. It's Delta. It is D. I'm sorry, I was looking at it, I read it too quick. Right. D is correct, yeah. So when Whenever, the Coast Guard guy's on the boat, you need a Coast Guard ensign because yep. whenever there is, whenever he is, he or she's in official capacity, then the uh, Coast Guard ensign replaces the auxiliary. Good. Sorry about that. Yeah, D is correct. Jane Bickle, 51. When several auxiliary vessels are on a patrol under a Coast Guard patrol commander, coordination of the auxiliary facilities will be accomplished by the designated. Of the. Uh, C, Auxiliary Facilities Commander. Correct. Is it C? No, I, I'm, yes, it, oh, yes. C. C. Oxcom. Yes, Oxcom. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that yeah. Oxcom is correct. Good. Um, Carson, number 52. Large areas to be patrolled can be divided into? Sectors. Delta. Sectors. Good. Bob Mac, 53. A grid for use in a patrol an area patrol operations is formed by two sets of blank with one set blank to the second set. Uh, I'll I'll say A parallel straight lines at right angles. You know I don't know this or not. Brian, is that correct? I don't have this one. Yeah. Up my end. Okay, A. Um, John Robertson, 54. When en route to assigned locations after a pre-patrol briefing, patrol vessels should examine the course for objects or debris. Correct. That is correct. Uh, Deb Salvi, 55, when a patrol vessel observes a casualty during a regatta patrol, blank should be advised of all details. B, the patrol commander. Correct. Uh, John Robertson, 56, when a patrol vessel is providing assistance during an emergency. Bravo. Getting live from the property. Yeah. yeah. People first. Deb Salvi, 57, when it is evident that assistance is needed in another sector, a patrol vessel should move to provide such assistance. Delta, only when ordered to do so by the patrol commander. 
Yes. Yeah, wait till it's decided by somebody else. Kevin Card shall get, take a shot at 58. Some examples of the types of navigation aid casualties that should be reported by radio are. Okay, that's going to be vandalism, attempts, uh, uh, current vandalism, attempted vandalism, or um, damage to the, uh, the aton in some type, um, missing atons. Uh, let's see, out of place, uh, Aton's, see. just general right. damaged ones. General damage, good. 59, Arcia, chart updating patrol, blank restricted to areas covered by NOAA NAS charts. Um, B, R not. R not. Um, Mazam number 60, disaster patrols are usually performed independently by the auxiliary, true or false? Yeah, get the Coast Guard. Uh, Kevin Worthy, are you with us yet? Um, Deb Salvi, 62, the preparation, I'm sorry, 61, copies of a flotilla disaster patrol plan should be provided to blank and the... Um, Dura, Durox? Durox and Division Captain. Good. John Puskar, 62. During the preparation of a flotilla disaster patrol plan, some of the agencies that should be consulted are? Uh, local uh, sheriff, police, and fire departments, American Red Cross, Civil Air Patrol, Federal Emergency Manpower Agency, FEMA, U.S. Power Squadron, commercial and sports fishing groups, and the uh, local marine public correspondence company. Good. Good. Last one, Gib 63. Auxiliaries should be trained in the characteristics and dangers of blank in their locality. Oh, I take it back. Oh, after that. Severe Sorry. weather. Severe weather. Good. Um, Mark Frankel, 64. Careful consideration should be given to auxiliaries joining civil defense organizations because... I could pass on that one. I didn't couldn't see that one out. Charlie. Hey, how about Paula Wicks? You got this one for us? 64. I made I a try at it. Maybe needed by the What was that, Paula? B. B you said? Charlie. All the auxiliary facilities and personnel may be needed Good. by the Coast Guard. Good. Yep. All right, 65. Uh, Drew Suss, the primary technique that an auxiliarist must employ when conveying messages to potential disaster victims is? Diplomacy. Good. Anita Luck has uh, 66, the captain of the port blank, always the senior search and rescue officer. Is not, B. Okay, that's correct. Pat Dugan, 67, activities associated with the port security and pollution programs are? Uh, detecting and reporting pollution, providing information, of ab, um, abnormal or illegal activities in the port and providing support during disaster and casualty uh, affecting the port. Good. Uh, Elaine, number uh, 68, regardless generally are? Charlie, organized water activities. Good. Let's see if we got any more. That's that. All right, team, let's take a break. And we are running way late. Um, and so let's take a real quick one and come back here in about a uh, quarter two, please. Bob, I, I want to uh, we, apologize for the answers. Of... All right, well, one person at a time. Uh, hang on, Brian. Who else was that? Yeah. John Puskar, what do you need? No, I'm sorry. Let me click off. Somebody else called besides Brian. Who is that? Deb. What's up, Deb? Deb. Um, Question 3-25 um, is C. It's on page 3-6 in our manual. Good. Yeah, sorry about that. 30, okay. 35 no. is, what's that? 3-25. Question. What, 35 is C, you said? 3-25 is C, marker or screen vessels. 35. Yeah. I'm sorry, 35 is C. No, 3-25 is C. 
two, five. 25 is C. I think we said we were going to go look at uh, number uh, 36 also. So it's the race committee with approval of PATCOM. So that one was A. 36 was A. Mm -hmm. So Bob, this is Kevin. I got I to check out, but um, All right, I, see that we're, we're, I see we're recording this. How do we get a copy of the recording? I will send everybody a link. Okay, great. See ya. Yeah, I apologize for everybody who ran a little late. These are long chapters. This one's a Bob, long chapter. Yeah, go ahead. Bob Smart, we can confirm 31 is, there was a question on the correct answer on 31. 31 was the patrol vessels. Okay, that's right. Okay. What what letter is that? That was uh, A. So number okay. 31, uh, it is responsible to patrol vessels to warn spectators of the obstructions. That's the bo official book answer. I think we thought it might be the sponsor, but... 31 is A, the patrol vessels. Uh, hi, Bob. Isn't uh, number four, number B, the Coast Guard only? It's on page 51 of the PowerPoint. You say number number four? No, it's A. Because you can assist uh, other agencies beside the Coast Guard. So you can assist state and local agencies with, for patrols uh, to for aids to navigation and chart updating purposes. So you can Bob, help other agencies besides uh, Coast Guard. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Bob, that, I'll give you one that I did with the, uh, with Noah. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, just, Patrick. I'm I sorry, can we talk we, about You can it do it with Noah. So that's why other agencies listed there. Okay, good. Any other questions? Sorry, we're running long, guys. Sorry about this. 61. Uh, 61. 61 is? Guy and division captain. 61 is uh, Durox and division captain, yes. Director of the auxiliary and division captain. Good. Any more questions? All right, guys, try to be back here at quarter till. You want to take a quick break? We're going to launch right then. Bob, I I want to apologize again for. Oh, it's okay. No worries. I no worries. Really sorry. <laughs> no, no. You know, and I I uh, if you haven't taught one of these classes in a while, I it's hard not. sometimes not to share what you know because and this is we're lucky to have you presenting tonight. I'm I'm delighted you're here, so don't worry about it. Um, I do have to jump off though. It's late. Yeah, it's late. Yeah, over. I've got an 0400 wake up time. All right, Brian, and uh, I'm sorry I missed your phone call at seven. Oh. Uh, but yeah, I did. Was sent seven central time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Brian. Right, thanks. thanks Good job. Thank Have you. Fun. Thanks, job. Brian. You're awesome, Carlson. Have a wonderful night. Thanks. Hey, Bob. It's Mike here. Can I ask yes. you something? You may, Michael. I didn't get you. You saying three dash five? Is that number? Three five, I think it's number letter C. Okay, right? let me know when you're ready. I'm sorry, you got you hear me, Bob? Yeah, I can hear you. Let me know when you're ready to listen. Okay, I'm 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 confused. I was looking for the answer for number thirty five. You're saying three dash five. I didn't get you. No, the, yeah, you you weren't really hearing too good there. Or answer for number three dash twenty five. Patrol vessels may be assigned as either C marker vessels or blank screen vessels. You want the answer for 35, yes. that would be a powerboat race contestant may be disqualified if attempts to assist conflict with race regulations. So right, what, what's the letter? Uh, that you? is B, mm -hmm. B is in B, Bravo. B Bravo, thank you. Good. How are you, Robert? What's the fastest you've ever taught chapter four? <laughs> I'm ready. All right, let's go ahead and have you share your screen. Uh, and uh, we'll be ready to go here when everybody shows up in two minutes. Hey, uh, Bob? Yeah. Jay, how are you tonight, sir? I'm fine. Uh, I guess we had a little confusion. I, I was logging in under uh, 06. So I guess uh, John Roberts fixed it. Yeah, I you know what? And I, you know what? I, I, I wrote down who was teaching each chapter, and I called you on the phone. And then I forgot to write it down. 
So uh, I asked Robert if he's willing to do that. You guys want to team teach and you can add anything you see uh, during the chapter? I can sit back and, and, and work with him on that. I know a lot of this. Uh, I just wanted to get together with you for, uh, for Friday night. I need, I need uh, the slides. Okay, um, we will get those to you. Okay, so I can review it, go over it. Yeah, you're teaching chapter five, right? For a minute, I thought I mo must have told you four. You got five, right? I got five. Oh, you got, got five, okay, good. I got health and hazards. Good. And after listening to me, it will be a healthy hazard. Uh -huh. <laughs> after they listen to me, it will be a healthy hazard. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for joining us tonight, Jane. Oh, I need a monitor. I wanted to see how things were gonna work out for this. Yeah, yeah, a couple of people have to bail because they got to get up early in the morning. So, um, yeah, I understand about bailing and, yeah. and getting up early in the morning. Bob, I'm just going to hand by with you. If you want me, I can unmute and keep you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and mute yourself. I'm going to turn my camera off here in about, well, uh, I guess that's quarter till right now. You ready, uh, Robert? Anybody got a question yeah. before we start chapter four? Do you see my screen? I do see your screen. Do you know how to start the slideshow? Uh, let's go to the upper left. It says slideshow. A little bit more upper to the left. Uh, I see yep. it. Left click there. And then over on the right, it'll pop up the word. Uh, where is it here? From beginning. Yeah. All the way to the left. Left more. One more. Yep. Left click there. All right. And then All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Robert Rexek. And if you would be kind enough, go ahead and stop your video and uh, mute yourselves. Are you there, Bob? Where'd you go? I'm uh, flashing to the beginning where I need to be. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was a lot of information Brian uh, kindly provided with us. Of course, it's exciting to have someone who's actually doing a lot of patrols. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome Robert Rexett. Okay. Welcome, sir. We are doing Chapter 4, Safety and Sur Survival Equipment uh, that's aboard the vessels. If it's a, an auxiliary vessel, you go through a form 7003, which is a vessel safety check for an operational vessel. So a lot of the, uh, there's a check boxes for all the things that you need to be on board. So a lot of this stuff that we're going through will already be on board because it is required. Uh, same thing for PWC, there are certain things, but due to the storage capacity of a PWC, you will not see a lot of items as such as extra life preservers, life preservers and uh, other things. Uh, the next, let's see, hang on. All right, PFDs. When the course was written and it said the preferred choice is PFD, now we just call them life jackets or life preservers. And one of the big things about using acronyms is a lot of people won't understand what you're talking about. So we tend to use what that acronym means, a life preserver, a life jacket. There are five types of uh, life jackets, PFDs, that are used. They use Roman, Roman numerals. Type one is an offshore life jacket. Type two, near shore, buoyant vest. Number three is a flotation aid. Four is a throwable device. And five special use hybrid devices. Type one is offshore. It's pretty large, bulky, hard to swim with. And it's for very rough water. The, it's got a buoyancy of at least 22 pounds of uh, foam that's inside that will keep you up. It will write an unconscious person in calm water. In other words, it will turn your body so that you're on your back. 
it can be put on if needed quickly either side so it is reversible and you'll still be correct in getting it on the color will either be international orange or red those are the two colors that are easily identified in the water two sizes a child less than 90 pounds and an adult. They are the ones that are preferred for delayed rescues. In other words, the chances of a boat being close by is uh, nil. The adult provides 15.5 pounds of buoyancy. And oh, this is type two provides 15.5 pounds of buoyancy and usually writes an unconscious person. Uh, these are the types sometimes you'll see uh, even on cruise ships that are in your uh, staterooms. And a wave action will tend to help you uh, get righted in the right direction where you are laying on your back. They may be any color, but again, the orange or red are, are preferable. Comes in three sizes, adult, more than 90 pounds, child medium, 50 to 90 pounds, and child small, two sizes. There's either a less than 50 pounds or less than 30 pounds. 30 pounds, that would be your infants. They will usually write an unconscious person with any wave action to assist. Type three, this is what, if you are in boat crew, you will be familiar with. It's flotation aid is 15.5 pounds. It has the same buoyancy as a type two there's less writing force due to distribution of the flotation material. It gives you greater comfort because it's uh, smaller in size. And it comes in various sizes and colors available. This is what you would see if you went to Boat US or uh, a Target or if they sell marine stuff. My preference when I'm doing a boat, uh, ve a vessel safety check, if people are just getting ready to uh, buy a, a boat and start getting the supplies for it, I usually recommend to them to get the bright colors, red, orange, or yellow, because it will make it much easier to spot if this person is in the water, especially during the nighttime operations. Type four, throwables. These are not designed to wear, but to assist in throwing if somebody you come upon or if they fell out off your vessel to give them assistance in staying afloat. My recommendation to people when doing a vessel safety check with their boat cushion is to have a polyurethane line that floats in the water and is able to connect to the cushion. And the reason for that is if you are throwing it, this uh, cushion to the person, if the wind happens to catch it and blows it away from the person in the water, at least you can retrieve it and try throwing it again. The other advantage is once that person does uh, grab onto that cushion, you can pull them safely to the vessel for them to climb up on the swim ladder or uh, any other means to assist them in getting out of the water. The other type that you will see on uh, larger boats is a orange ring and that comes in either white or orange. On sailboats you will see uh, looks like a horseshoe and that is either going to be in yellow or white. They are not designed to wear and they do come with 20 pound flotation.
It's the horseshoe buoy. Type five, special uses in hybrids. Some are float coats, coveralls. There could be inflatables. And these are approved for limited use as specified on the label. They will meet the requirements for a type three, but only when worn. Example are anti-exposure coveralls. On our auxiliary vessels for cold water or cold temperatures, when it's uh, 60 below, uh, less uh, temperature of water or the air temperature, we may be required to what they call the Mustang. And if we do wear the Mustang, what we will put over it will be our SAR vest, which carries our knife and mirror, whistle, and EPIRB. Inflatable PFDs require extra care. Uh, you have to uh, check for leaks, and if you expand them, either by they automatically uh, opened up with the uh, inflating uh, CO2 tube, or you did uh, blow them with a mouthpiece to uh, activate and use them in the water, you have to then repack carefully. And also, it's a good time to check if there were any leaks, if there was any uh, uh, damage to it in whatever you were doing. Cleaning PFDs should be washed with fresh warm water and a mild detergent. One of the uh, agents that I have heard to use would be Woolite, which has been gentle and it helps clean the uh, PFD or life jacket. You rinse and clean fresh water to get that residue off. Store in a cool, dry place out of the sun and make sure all your PFDs after being used, if you're just swimming, playing around with your own private vessel to uh, let them dry out so that they don't uh, create any mildew or mold on them if stored. Keep away from oil, paint, and grease. Some of that may discolor it or even uh, create a um, weakness in the fabric. Wear only on or near the water. And the old uh, slogan is, PFDs or life jackets float, you don't. Personal marking lights. They have evolved over time. A lot of them are much brighter. Some of them are coded now to do the SOS. Uh, with the LED type lighting, it is a much brighter light and saves on battery usage. Current regulations require the auxiliary crew to use the equipment issued by the Coast Guard. That is all regulation. The following information is provided for test purposes only. So, P uh, personal marking lights are chemical or battery. So these are things that would be in the test questions, but are no longer uh, required in our equipment. Attached to the PFD, what is correct in this uh, line is that everything that you have in your SAR vest is attached to the vest through a lanyard to the piece of equipment so that it will not get lost and when you're in the water because uh, your hands will be getting cold if you're in the water and these things, you may not be able to close your hand completely and you will lose the item. So with the lanyard, you'll be able to pull it back to you. The PML personal marking light, these are uh, what you have seen, like they do at uh, 4th of July, it's one of these sticks that you snap 
and then it'll glow. We used to use these on uh, 067, which is our auxiliary vessel. And we had red ones, green, and white. And we would give that to a vessel if they either lost a bulb, the light was out, and it was something for them to be able to attach to their vessel or to hold so that it was a marker during nighttime operations until they got back to the harbor safely. This is just saying how long these uh, glow sticks would last depending on the temperature. And they only have one life. Once you break them, they're done. You safely uh, discard them. Strobe uh, personal marking lights, battery life up to five years, light duration, nine to 15, visibility up to five miles. What we do with our SAR jackets, when we're going through inspection before the boating season, which is an annual process, the R strobe lights, we will replace that battery, kind of like your smoke detector. Always put a new fresh battery in, this way you know you should be safe for the uh, season. And again, these are all things that are for uh, uh, for test purposes only. Uh, we do carry a um, a flashlight, uh, and again, too, that is checked for the battery life too. Survival suit, exposure suit, used to abandon ship in cold environments. This is in Alaskan waters. We will not see that here in our waters off of uh, Coast Guard Station Wilmette. It is a closed cell neoprene wetsuit, favorite, favorite of PWC operators and scuba divers. A dry suit used as an exterior shell to keep thermal layers dry must be an additional PFD to provide flotation. Uh, this is like a, uh, kind of almost like an overall, and uh, you, it's just to keep your ODUs uh, dry and uh, you still wear a PFD or with your SAR vest then. The anti-exposure coveralls Mustang suit. Again, this is when the weather is cold, you will, the order issuing uh, station or authority will tell you, you don't have to wear it, but take it with you on the vessel. So if conditions change, you are then to put that uh, suit on. It is a good protection to the atmospheric uh, air especially if it's cold and it includes flotation. Uh, I've uh, worn it a couple times in some cold weather uh, uh, operations and it does make quite a difference. You do feel comfortable in it. The Marine, uh, let's see, the MSD Mustang uh, Suit 900. This is a cross between a dry suit and anti-exposure coveralls. The Coast Guard, if they had, you've seen them wearing it, it is going to be uh, orange and black with reflective markers on the jacket part and the pants, trousers will be all black. This is also this type of uh, suit is used by the Navy SEALs, and that one will be strictly all black. Reflective tape. T today's uh, PFDs have this already uh, built in, they're sewn in. But if you don't have it, 
it is something that you can purchase and just follow the in, uh, instructions given by the manufacturer how to apply it. It is very, it's an important item, especially if you're in the water, because if we're shining lights, that is will, what will stand out. Uh, on some of the patrols I've been on, a couple evening, we ran into kayakers that were in rough water off of uh, Northwestern University. And it was surprising. The only thing in the waves you were able to catch was just the top of their head. And that's how you knew somebody was in the water. And you can just imagine if they were just in the water without a vessel, what you would see. So it is very important. Have a good whistle. The whistles issued by the Coast Guard will give you a range of 1,000 yards. Check them out. Make sure they do work. Personal marking lights. Those are what we just covered. Um, it is either with the strobe or you can have it as a flashlight. A signaling mirror. This is what you use the sun for. There is a sighting hole and you make sure you are pointing it to the, you know, you're looking through the light or the hole in the mirror the shiny side is facing the sun. And through the uh, circle, you are using that to sight what you are, that reflection to be seen by. And you can hold your hand up to make sure that you are getting a reflection off of that mirror. But um, learn how to work with it, get comfortable, making sure that you know how to operate it if it is required. The visual distress signals, this is no longer required for personal equipment. And usually your vessel will have all this on board as a requirements. We do, we used to be required to carry flares on a person, but this was uh, now no longer required. Transceiver, handheld radio. Uh, usually on vessels, uh, auxiliary vessels, you have uh, multiple radios to work with. Uh, you're monitoring the station. You're monitoring channel 16. Uh, on larger vessels, uh, you could be uh, having uh, a handheld radio and you could be near the rear of the vessel so you are hearing what's going on if you be due to engine noise not being able to hear what is actually being done at in the by the coxswain area so uh but you got to make sure that you're not going to interfere with the reception where you'll start getting a squeal on the uh, radios a survival knife this is also piece of your SAR vest and to make sure that the SAR vest that you have with the knife that the knife tip is either broken off or ground off you don't want a sharp point because you could damage your uh, life jacket by putting a tear in and then uh, compromising the flotation material and uh, you don't really need that point for anything other than the knife part for cutting a line if in emergency on a toe, uh, if there's a problem. Die markers, uh, we really don't have that. They might be a part of uh, the vessel uh, equipment. Uh, day, night, flare, smoke. I, again, it's not required for personal carry, but it may be the requirements on your vessel. And it is. That is part of that 7003 uh, checkoff list when you're doing, uh, uh, checking the vessel for to be an operational facility. Helmeted gloves, again, that's not uh, a requirement on the boat. Uh, gloves, it'd be good to have if needed, if you're uh, working with uh, 
some sharp objects. Fresh water. Well, we always carry fresh water, uh, especially in the uh, hot summer days when you're on patrol, just to keep yourself hydrated. EPIRBs. It's an electronic positioning indicating radio beacon. These are now issued by the Coast Guard to everybody uh, as a, that is a qualified crew or coxswain. The EPIRBs that were initially issued to facilities, which could be either the large one that if put into the water will then automatically uh, uh, start up and start sending a signal. But right now everybody uh, does carry their own individual uh, EPIRB. And what we do on a monthly basis is go through a test operation to make sure that that battery is uh, uh, working and well, and the whole unit is. There is an expiration on these EPIRBs and that's usually checked on an annual basis and anything being that's going to be expiring during the boating season or has expired during the winter months, should be replaced by the Coast Guard. This is where it's saying now, they are now issued to all members in the boat crew program and are required for patrol. Um, life raft, uh, most of our boats don't carry additional uh, life rafts, these are going to be, of course, on larger vessels. Um, I can't really talk too much about it, uh, don't know too much about it, but it's activated by water as a vessel sinks. Automatic deployment with a tether. In other words, if you do have one on board, when you're putting it into the water and it's being activated, make sure it's tethered to your vessel. Otherwise, if there's a swift current or wind, it will take it away from you and it's going to be uh, not a good picture. But if the vessel's sinking, eventually you have to detach the tether. That's right. <laughs> if when the boat's going down or it's on fire, you want to go <laughs> be uh, safe. The larger uh, uh, rafts will carry a uh, supplies needed in the raft are water, there's food, first aid kit, fishing hooks and line. Uh, I would think this is more in uh, big open waters uh, where you're going to need something like this. And uh, your uh, re rescue time is going to take a little time to get there. If you do deploy a... Uh, life raft board directly, not uh, jumping into water or getting wet. You want to stay dry because once you're in that raft, and especially if it's nighttime, you're not going to dry off. So you want uh, to stay as dry as possible. You stay with the vessel in any debris because that creates a larger target for searchers, whether it's uh, uh, water, uh, you know, boats or aircraft. It's a greater uh, target with all of that in the area. Salvage anything useful, whatever you can, that will help you survive any time that you have to spend in that raft. Blankets, um, uh, solar blankets, which are very light and uh, got a reflective material on it. Have a bailer, soak up any water, make sure you got towels, that will help it. Or even a, a cooler if needed. You can empty out the cooler and just bail with using the cool, uh, cooler to take the water out. Huddle together to retain warmth if you can. If as long as you're keeping that raft stable, have always lookouts. Even if you're on crew, your first job is to be a lookout 
and then the uh, perform any uh, duties that the coxswain assigns to you. But lookout is always your main uh, job. If you have to, if you have flares, unless you see somebody, don't knock, you know, shoot them off because you're only wasting them. If you think, if you have an aerial one or even a handheld, maybe fire off one hope, in the hope that uh, somebody may see it. But hang on, don't uh, just keep one after another. Use flares and pairs. In other words, after it's the first one goes out, have another one. This way, whoever sees this knows that there must be a, an issue out wherever that the light was seen. Food and water is to be rationed as necessary because you don't know how long it's going to be before you are rescued. So take minimum requirements if as needed. That is it. All right, way to, way to go scooting through there. If you want to hit the stop share. All right. Up uh, there at the top, maybe at the bottom. I'm not sure if it says stop share. Maybe all the way at the top. Pause share. So it's uh, stop uh, sharing. Stop share. Cool. Okay, are we back? Excellent. Any questions for Robert before we start blasting through these? I know some of you had to leave early. This is going to be recorded, so you can look at it later. Any questions for Robert? Uh, Bob and Robert, this is Patrick. Uh, Hi, Patrick. Just, just a, um, a couple quick points. Um, the, um, the tape that's mentioned in the, in the slide says reflective. It should be retro reflective. There's a difference between reflective and retro reflective. Everything that is in boating is retro reflective. So, uh, and that's also listed in the book as retro reflective. So the slide is off a little bit. Uh, the other item is, that you can have um, is a space blanket. So those, um, you know, kind of uh, plastic foil blankets that you can get at the uh, right. survival stores. They sure. work real well. So that's it. All right. Thank Good. You. Any other questions? Good. We're going to blast through these quick as we can because I know some people got to get up pretty soon. Uh, Gibbs, we're going to have you do number one. The responsibility for safety on a patrol vessel rests with the? Alpha toxin. Coxon, good. Deb Salvi, number two, the auxiliaries in charge must ensure that all required equipment and blank are on board. You there, Deb? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Safety-related items, C. Correct. Good. Mark Frankel, number three, the type designation of a PFD defines the expected flotation performance in? Uh, I selected any water. Any water. No, I don't know the top of that one off the top of my head. D. E. Yeah. All right. I think it is. C. A. No, it's C. It's not no, C. Tom Waters. C. C. Thank you. Tom Waters. Okay. Calm water. So C. Okay. They're looking for C. Good. Number uh, four, um, Carlos. Currently, there are blank types of approved personal flotation devices. Bravo, five. Five, right. And uh, in case you haven't uh, been watching any of the updated material coming through, they're getting ready to try, they're going to redo the whole thing. But for the purposes of the test, for, for the purposes of this class, right now we're going to stick with what they presented here. Five is good. Uh, whose turn is it? Uh, Paul Wicks, number five, the offshore life jacket type one PFD has the blank buoyancy of all PFDs and is designed to position and maintain an unconscious person in a blank position. Uh, that would be D, the greatest buoyancy in a vertical or slightly backward position. Yeah, so that their head is out of the water. Good. Uh, Anita, I don't know if I called you in a but I'm going to call you now. Six, the offshore life jacket is especially suitable when there is a probability of? A delayed rescue, B. Good. Uh, Patrick Dugan, number seven, the Coast Guard approved PFD that is the most effective in rough water is the blank because it provides the greatest blank to its wearer. A, offshore life jacket type uh, one flotation protection. Correct. Uh, Larry Lindbergh, number eight, 
the only wearable PFD that must be reversible is the? Alpha, offshore life jacket. Must be reversible. Not that's, is that the one that flips you over? Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, the first one. It has to be reversible. Yes, sorry. I want to be giving you bad information. Number uh, nine, uh, let's see, Mike McGann. The offshore life jacket comes in two sizes, adult for persons weighing blank pounds and over, and the child for persons weighing less than blank pounds. You there, Michael? Mikey McGann? Hello, bravo. B, 60 and 90. I don't think that's correct. Sorry, 90, 90. 90. Yeah. 90. Charlie? Is it B? Charlie. Yeah, cheap. 90 and 90. So they're looking for a slightly bigger weight. Good. 10. Uh, Pete Nofke, one of the authorized colors for an offshore life jacket is? P, Delta, Indian Orange. Injured. Good. Justin, number 11, a nearshore buoyant vest is designed to turn its wearer to a blank position in, in the water. A, I think it's yeah, so this B. Is, yeah, vertical or slightly backward. Yeah, it doesn't, it does not as good as the A. I mean, it's I mean, not as good as a type one. So this is the Yeah, we don't part. want face down. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so good. Jessica McAllister, number 12, the color of a nearshore buoyant vest. Uh, B, maybe any okay. color. Bob Mack, number 13, the nearshore buoyant vest is manufactured in blank sizes. Hope you know something. Uh, three sizes. Three sizes. John Robertson, 14, the, near, the smallest nearshore buoyant vest is for ch used by a child weighing less than blank pounds. 30. You say B30? B30. All right. De Deb, number 15, the turning characteristics of a nearshore buoyant vest is blank, that of an offshore life jacket. Charlie, less than. Good. Correct. Uh, and Penny Ross, four, uh, 16, the nearshore buoyant vest is usually preferred when there's a probability of a blank rescue. Quick. Bravo. B, good. Uh, Ar uh, Arcia, number uh, 17, a type mm. 3 PFD is known as a? Um, D, flotation aid. Correct, good. Uh, Hasm, uh, Mark Salal, number 18, a flotation aid blank position and maintain an unconscious person in a vertical or slightly backward uh, position in the water. A. Bravo. B is probably yeah, it's not going to flip you over. You know, that's a lot. Of, it's supposed to help you. You should be able to swim in that one. Good. Kevin said he's having microphone problems, so we are going to go back to the top of the list. Uh, and now I show it's Bob Mack. Um, the 19, the buoyancy of the flotation aid is blank that for the nearshore buoyant vest. It is... Uh, I'm going to say more than, or it's uh, less than, excuse me, less than. Yeah, the flotation aid is not as good as the best. Correct, it's less than, B. Mike McGann, number 20, the main advantage of a flotation uh, aid. Just a second, I'm sorry, that's wrong. That's, a that's wrong. A. A. Oh, is it? That's oh, alpha. A. That's A alpha. Right. I disagree. So yeah, the agree. turning characteristic of the nearshore vest is less than an offshore no, no. no what, one, what one was the it? The same as. 19. The same a. as. The same as. Same okay, as. good. See, now so I thought it was less. Alpha? Cool. Alpha. 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 Same yeah. as. 20, uh, Carlson. The main advantage oh. of... Mike. Yes, Mike. No, you, that was, I thought you had me that question. Oh, go okay, ahead. Mike, number 20. The main advantage of a flotation aid is its... Uh, writing tendency. Comfort. B, bravo. Oh, disagree. No, yeah, they're they're looking for comfort because it's easy. You know, if you're in the water, it's easy to use, so that uh, you'll be willing to wear it. Especially if you're going to be using your arms a lot. 
So it doesn't seem, it seems like it should be safety. I see what you're thinking there, Mike, but no, they're looking for comfort. Uh, so that one is C. Carlson, number 21, a type 4 PFD is designed blank a person in the water. To be thrown to a person in the water. Correct. Good. Bob Mack, number 22, the most common throwable devices are the blank and the blank. The, oops. Alpha. Alpha. Good. The buoyant cushion, which you see a lot of people sitting on in the ring buoy. Uh, yeah. Mark Frankel, number 23, of the type four PFDs, the buoyant cushion blank, but the ring buoy blank. Uh, Charlie, so maybe any color, but the ring buoy, the uh, but the ring buoy is uh, white or orange. Uh, who's next? Yeah, Paul Wicks, what's that? Twenty-four. Paul Wicks, the type of PFD that is approved by the Coast Guard for limited use is the blank PFD. C type five. Type five. Very good. Uh, Anita Lutkiss, how about 25, the mildew inhibitor treatment required for all PFDs blank, fully protect the PFD from deterioration in a damp locker aboard a vessel? Will not be. Good. Patrick Duggan, number 26, a soiled fabric PFD should be washed in fresh blank water with a blank detergent and then rinsed in clean fresh water. That'd be A, warm. What was that? A, warm a. and mild. Oh, sorry. Uh, Deb, I'll give you the next one. We'll see if it works here. 427, if it doesn't, we won't worry about it. PFDs blank be stored where they are subject to direct sunlight. Should not be. Right, yeah. You got to have them available, but you also don't want them getting wrecked. Uh, where were we? Pat Leonardi, 28. PFDs should be kept away from blank and greasy substances. Uh, oil, paint, and any chemicals. C, Charlie. C is correct. Uh, who does that leave? Larry Lindbergh, 29. PFDs stored in their original plastic wrappers. Bravo are not readily available. Yeah, those don't count for your safety purposes. Very good. Uh, Pete Nofke, 30. <laughs> to make them more visible in the dark, blank is R required on all PFDs used by the Coast Guard. Uh, D, Delta Retro Reflective Material. Very good, just like Pat Lee already said. Justin Johnson, 31, standard Navy life preservers, blank Coast Guard approved use aboard civilian vessels. Going to be B or not. I'll double check the answer. It's 31, unless somebody knows different. Uh, Jessica McAllister, back to you. The Navy life preserver is one of the best preservers for... There, just uh, yeah, keeping a person afloat. Good. Carlos, number 33, most chemical PMLs have a useful shelf life of about blank. What was that? This is a hint. What did you say, Carlson? Did I lose you, Carlson? Oh, Charlie, I'm sorry. I was, I was Charlie is correct. That's Charlie, all right. No worries. John is getting late. Sorry about that. Number 34, John Robertson, a fresh chemical light stick at a temperature of 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit will provide light for about blank to blank hours. Uh, the gravel. Oh, 12 hours. Uh, there's a couple guys answered. I'm trying to remember who I called on again. Uh, who was it I called on? I can't remember. John Robertson. John, what did you say was the answer? Bravo, 8 to 12. 8 to 12. Good. I think that's right. Gibbs, number 35, at colder temperatures, a chemical light stick will have a blank life and will have blank brilliancy. Bravo, longer and less. Good, he is correct. Uh, RCF 36, the two potentially lethal consequences of falling into cold water are blank and blank. You there, RCF? 36, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, drowning and hypothermia. C is correct. Excellent. Uh, Hazem, you want to take a shot at number 37? The four basic design concepts for buoyant thermal protection garments are. There, Mark? Yeah. You got this one? It's a long one. I give yeah. you the long ones. Yeah. Sorry, pass. Okay. Uh, Gibbs, you want to take a shot at this one? Uh, survival, tight fitting wetsuit, dry suit, and anti-exposure coveralls. 
38, uh, Mike McGann, you want to take a shot at this one? Anti-exposure coveralls are designed to provide blank movement. Mm, let's say full freedom of. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Deb Salby, let's see if it works now. 39, tight-fitting foam suits, common scuba divers, wetsuits, protect the wearers from exposure in? A, moderately cold water. Good. Uh, Mark Frankel, 40, tight-fitting wetsuits have buoyancy characteristics that will cause a wearer to float blank in the water. Horizontally. Horizontally, yeah. Gumby's good. <laughs> 41, uh, Anita. A dry suit that not, need not be used with a PFD because it has sufficient built-in buoy with, with because it has sufficient built-in buoyancy. You know this one, Indian? I'm sorry, I'm muted. B false. It does not. Okay, need not be good. Uh, Patrick Leonardi, 42. Anti-exposure coveralls have the same flotation characteristics as an flotation aid. Yeah, not that great. See, See Charlie. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Lindbergh, I can't remember whether we were able to get a hold of you before, but we'll make 43 years. One primary reason to have a survival knife in your person is to blank during an escape from a sinking vessel. Charlie, free yourself from entangling lines. Yes, he is correct. Uh, let's see, where are we here? Pete Nofke, 44, a disadvantage of a folding knife as a survival knife is that? See, Charlie, it may be impossible to open it with your cold hands. Correct. Justin Johnson, 45, the effective range of a police type whistle is about? Uh, 1,000 yards. 1,000, hey, good. Jessica McAllister, 46, if a special signaling mirror with a sighting hole is not available, blank may be used for the same purpose. Any common mirror, D. I don't, I think they were looking for B here. Is it, is it, uh, does anybody else have the answer right in front of them? I think they're looking for any shiny objects. I think you can use a CD. I think a any CD. Any common works. mirror. Is it? Yeah. yeah. D. The answer is D. It is D. All right. I'm sorry. I didn't know that D one. Delta? Yeah, any common mirror. Delta. Yeah. So that's the answer they're looking for on the test. Uh, I can see B, but the answer they're looking for on the test is D. Good. Uh, Carlson, number 47, describe how the signaling mirror with the sighting hole is used. <coughs> Hold the mirror in one hand while adjusting to reflect the sun's light and turn it slowly in the direction of the object that you desire to signal. Use your hand in front of it, good. Right on, thanks Carlson. Bob Mack, 48, blank visual distress signals should be included in or on a PFD when worn on a patrol vessel that is operating more than three miles from shore. We talked about that they've changed that rule, but for the purposes of this test, Bob? Yeah, I'm there. Um, I'm gonna say flares and smoke. Good, that's what that, for the test, so don't. Don't get thrown off by the rules or not that at that anymore. Good. Uh, John Robertson, uh, number 49, a strobe personal marker light can normally be seen up to blank miles depending upon the height of the observer's eye and the meteorological visibility conditions. Bravo, up to five. Five big ones, okay. Uh, whose turn is it now? Um, Penny Ross, 50, a good helmet for use on boats under hazardous conditions is a motorcycle type helmet with uh, little or no corrodible hardware. Hey, Bob. Yeah, go ahead. I, yeah, this one, as a safety director, I take exception with because mm -hmm. unless they specify a, a, a PWC or an off-road motorcycle helmet, a road one would take on a lot of water. If it gets wet, that interior lining is just going to be like a sponge and just hold all the water, and your head's going to be... Um, mm -hmm bobbing underneath the water. So that's just my, you know, take as a safety. Guess. Very good. 51 has them. A small raft is most likely to capsize if a person in the water attempts to enter it. From the side. From the, what's that? He Charlie from the side. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Cap, Cap, oh no, Kevin can you hear me. Who's here? Back to you, uh, Mark, for 52. The best place to enter an oblong or rectangular shaped raft when in the water is? 
at an end. Charlie. Charlie, C, at an end. Okay. Rectangular shape. Everybody got that? Uh, Patrick Leonardi, 53. Any water in a raft should be removed by bailing or? Uh, C, Charlie, soaking it up. Soak it up with a towel. Good. Deb number 54. When survivors are in life rafts prior to being located blank to watch for aircraft or vessels. Uh, B, lookout should be posted. Very good. Jeb's number 55 is survivors in life rafts cannot expect to be rescued immediately. Delta, food and water should be rationed. Good. Uh, Mike began 56, if more than one person is aboard a raft, a good way to maintain body heat is to? Huddle together, Charlie. Correct. Uh, Paula, number 57, if survivors are aboard more than one raft, the raft should be? Tied together. B is correct. Good. Uh, Anita, number, I think there's one more, isn't there? No, that's no, all she wrote. That's it. Good. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm yeah, going to stop recording.